from Washington, an address by the President of the United States on the situation in Vietnam. Here is CBS News White House correspondent Dan Rather. Good evening. The President of the United States will address the nation from the, his Oval Office in the White House West Wing. This date roughly coincides with the two domestic anti-war moratorium demonstrations across the nation. I have initiated a plan which will end this war in a way that will bring us closer to that great goal. And so tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. In 1969, the most polarizing issue dividing the nation was the war I'd already seen firsthand in Vietnam. No soldier worthy of the name will leave even a dead comrade on the field of battle and abandon him. The majority opinion of the country is turning against the war. It really didn't happen until the bodies and the high casualty rates started coming back and affected every neighbor in the country. There was a growing segment of the population that said enough and protest, and you had people in the streets. I grant you that it always has been the function of youth to defend liberty and innovation. And I don't think any one of us really regret the rebellion, but maybe we have so long ridiculed authority in the family and law in the state that the freedom we all fought so hard for has brought us close to chaos. Vince Lombardi did feel out of place. He was wondering why the, the younger generation was rebelling, and he felt that he didn't truly understand it, and he wanted to. I am not talking about repression. Everyone has the right to dissent. Unlike their coach, most Redskins players kept their political opinions to themselves. There isn't a great deal of discussion about the war in Vietnam and who's lining up for it or who's against it. Our job is perform on Sundays. The only guy who was really interested in politics was Ray Shockey, and Ray was a McGovern Democrat. In 68, when Martin Luther King got killed and Bobby got killed, I uh, determined I would never, ever sit on the sideline again. The war movement is beginning, and I'm supporting that movement. But in the meantime, I'm trying to deal with Lombardi and just trying to make the team. The balancing act between playing football and coping with political unrest was taking its toll. The Redskins were reeling as their troubled coach struggled for answers. I'll pass away and it's intercepted in the end zone. Come on! Right, knock out Jurgensen down. Jurgensen the throw. He's probably hitting down. In five November games, the Redskins notched only one win. The losses piled up, and so did the injuries. The team was also missing players who'd been called away for reasons that had nothing to do with football. The White House police are trying to expel two or three uh, people who are attempting to sit in here at the Northwest Gate on Pennsylvania Avenue. Now here in Washington, D.C., the National Guard Armory right across the street from Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Stadium. Roughly a half dozen members of the Redskins were active National Guardsmen. And that meant they spent a lot of time doing guard duty. They worked in their football practices when they could. On Sunday, a short walk, no more than 50 yards, right across the street to RFK Stadium, play in the game. As soon as the game is over, quick shower and back to guard duty. Before anyone can embrace freedom, I think they must first embrace those things which underline freedom. And they are duty and respect for authority and a development of a mental discipline. Three Redskin starters would find themselves on the front lines during the largest anti-war protest in American history. The D.C. National Guard was activated more than anybody because of student demonstrations marching up the DuPont Circle. And we were tear gassing the students. We didn't judge their win right. So we let go our tear gas. The wind was blowing this way. We tear gassed ourselves. Mid-November 1969, climatic moment in the Battle of Images, right in front of the great Lincoln Memorial, in front of the Washington Monument. 
the crescendo of the anti-war movement. Here in the nation's capital, organizers of the moratorium were jubilant. It's big, they kept saying, bigger than we thought it would be. But if there is one thing that is... Meanwhile, the Nixon administration was busy crafting its own images in response to those playing out in Washington streets. White House Special Assistant Dwight Chapin drafted a memo suggesting strategies to counter the moratorium, including one that would make Mr. Nixon the first sitting president ever to attend an NFL game. One of the conclusions in the memorandum was focusing on what most Americans do on a weekend. And they either mow the lawn or they go to a ball game or they do something uh, that is recreational. On Saturday, the president made the point of watching on television the Ohio State Purdue College game. Then he decided to come to RFK Stadium. He came partly because of his own excitement about Lombardi and the new Redskins, but no doubt because of the political optics that he'd have here. It did set up a contrast. He wanted the country to know that a president could still move freely within Washington, D.C., that football fans were different than the moratorium people. I think the Redskins made a decision as to what they wanted to do for their halftime that involved all the branches of the armed forces to put on a patriotic display. The president was overwhelmed by that. He sent a letter to Coach Lombardi, paying special thanks to the demonstration of patriotism that he saw when he was out there that day. Just before kickoff, the sleep-deprived Redskins National Guardsmen staggered into RFK Stadium. We played the Cowboys on Sunday. They got us a three-hour pass. We were in our fatigues. Jerry Smith shows up in his in his military khakis. He's the starting tight end. And he says, I spent a whole damn night in a Jeep, freezing my ass off someplace. I get off at six, I still don't know whether I'm gonna be allowed to go to the game. That was a long weekend, and sometimes when you're fatigued, that's when you have your best games. And I think that's when Jerry was really focused, and you had a guy like Sonny who's laying it in there. Jorgensen to throw, and the end zone, it is a touchdown to Jerry Smith. Smith put on a show for the president with three touchdown catches, but it wasn't nearly enough to beat the Cowboys. From my seat at RFK that afternoon, I sensed Lombardi's Redskins were in trouble. The coach now faced the real possibility of severing the first losing season of his NFL career.